Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again on November, our Immigrant and Refugee Affairs Forum. <clears throat> it's so great to have all of you. Um, we have great attendance. I can see um, enough people have joined today. And we have amazing agenda. I, ha I will go back and share the agenda again. Um, I'll just go over uh, the agenda quickly, and then I'll do the deed updates later on. Um, I probably might be joined by Ekta, who might do a public engagement update. But for this time, we have, um, you know, Minnesota's digital equity plan that we wanted all of you to uh, that have already did the input. I know that we have the uh, public comments closed, but we will talk a little bit about um, how you can get involved and what the team has done so far uh, to compile the, the state's plan. And then we will talk about uh, some of the workforce related grants that are up there uh, that are uh, open right now. Uh, the targeted community grant and the drive for five and we will welcome you to um, ask questions as much as you can and and give us feedback as well and then from there on we will go ahead and do our uh, updates on some of the projects that that are out there that we think the community should uh, focus on and then we will open for forum discussion and please at any moment at any time feel free to uh, chat your um, questions comments feedbacks and after every session, when we're done, we will go ahead and answer those questions. And then, of course, at the end, if you have any comments or any questions or any updates, we'll welcome you after four o'clock. And of course, we'll be now we have the team that's standing ready to talk about the digital equity plan. And I would um, give you over Hannah, um, who will share some slides and take it from here. Thank you. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. Let me try that again. Yes, we can see that right now. Excellent, all right. Well, thanks for having me today. My name is Hannah Buckland. I'm the Digital Equity Program Lead at the Office of Broadband Development. And so our office is within DEED. Our executive director is Bree Mackey, and our current team is split into two parts. We have what we call the infrastructure side and the digital equity side. The infrastructure side is a team that's focused on broadband infrastructure specifically, like actual wires in the ground. And then the digital equity team is me and one other person. Her name is Megan. Um, and we're currently hiring for a couple new positions. So our office is growing. I'm going to briefly cover today some information about the Digital Equity Act and Minnesota's participation in it. In the upper left corner of each slide, you'll see where we are in that little three item agenda. So it's like your um, GPS in a way. I'm gonna start by reviewing the Digital Equity Act, which was included in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was passed in November of 2021 by Congress. This funding for the Digital Equity Act is administered by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Our acronym for that is NTIA. The Digital Equity Act provides $2.75 billion for digital equity work. And we'll define digital equity on the next slide. Within the Digital Equity Act, there are three different funding categories. Right now, Minnesota and every other state is working with a planning grant. Minnesota's planning grant is $881,989.10. Stumbled on that today. Um, after states use their planning grants to create a statewide plan for how um, technology access can be expanded so that everyone can use technology, then states have access to capacity grants. Capacity grants are what we use to implement the activities identified in the plans. Um, and at the same time, there will be some grants available at the federal level um, competitively for any municipality or nonprofit that's interested. So we're focused on a planning grant right now and then eventually a capacity grant sometime in 2024. We don't know how much and we don't know when, but we know that sometime in 2024, we'll have that capacity grant funding. So the definition of digital equity that we're working with in this planning process 
is that it's a condition in which all individuals and communities have the information technology capacity needed for full participation in society, democracy, and the economy. And what this refers to is opportunities and options. Digital equity is about everyone having the option to have access to technology and everyone being able to take advantage of the opportunities that technology access affords. My example of what it means to be like a digitally equitable world um, without every solution being the same is the fact that I still have this super cool flip phone. Um, I don't have a smartphone. I don't want a smartphone. I have a laptop. That's great. My flip phone doesn't really do much, but it does what I want it to do. And it does what I need it to do in order for me to achieve my quality of life goals. So that's what we're really talking about here. We're not talking about everyone using technology in the same way to do the same things. We're talking about everyone using technology in the way that makes sense for them to achieve the quality of life that they desire. Digital inclusion is another phrase we um, hear about in this area quite often. Digital equity is the condition, and then digital inclusion are the activities that get us to that condition. There are five different activities highlighted here. The first is affordable internet service. So my infrastructure colleagues are focused on getting that actual infrastructure out there. Um, our digital equity team is looking more closely at whether that service is actually affordable. The second component is internet enabled devices that meet the needs of the user. Often that's a laptop or another large screen device. Um, a smartphone can be an excellent lifeline, but it's really hard to write a paper or apply for a job using only a smartphone. The third is access to digital literacy training. This is asking the question, who do you, who do you go to when you have um, a question about how technology works or how to do the thing you're trying to do? I worked as a librarian for 10 years before coming to DEED. And so when my parents think, who do we ask for technology help? They automatically come to me. They both have iPhones. I do not have an iPhone. Um, so there's this funny component to digital literacy where people naturally assume the people they trust are the people who will have the answers, but that's not always the case. Um, and it's important that people are finding someone who both is trustworthy and knowledgeable about the technology they need assistance with. The fourth component is quality technical support. So when something breaks, who helps you fix it? And then number five on this list is a bit babbly, but it refers to having the software and the content that you need in order to do the things you're trying to do. So if you're trying to write a paper for a, a college class and you're using um, a Google Docs, but your internet's cutting in and out, you'd be much better off with Microsoft Word, but that is an expensive license. So that's what this last component is looking at. With each state's digital equity plan, we're required to address eight different covered populations in the content of that plan. These are the eight that are required. Um, it's low income households. And so these are households at or below 150% of the federal poverty level, aging individuals 60 years of age or older, incarcerated individuals, veterans, individuals with disabilities, individuals who are experiencing a language barrier. This could be someone with limited English speaking skills or someone with lower English literacy individuals who are members of a minoritized racial or ethnic group and rural individuals. And of course, like humanity is not so simple and straightforward that people fit into one category and only one category. It's entirely possible that a person fits into all of these categories, some of these categories, that a person might be you know, rural for part of their life and then move into a suburb, or they might be learning to speak English for part of their life and then develop a mastery of that later on. So we'll focus now on Minnesota's planning process, just to give you some background on how we've approached this monumental task. So the goal is to create this digital equity plan that addresses those eight covered populations and looks at affordability, access, um, digital literacy, those things. 
Um, every state has the freedom to produce a plan using whatever strategy they desire, as long as they have that result at the end of the eight covered populations and all of that. So some states are working with one contractor who's doing their entire plan for them. Um, some states have advisory groups of maybe 10 to 20 people who kind of hold all of the power around what their plan should look like. There are states that are doing some really wild um, road trips where they go to every single county in their state and do a listening session and then write their plan and then go back to every county in their state and do a listening session. Um, we don't have the weather for that in Minnesota, we quickly established. So we wanted to make sure that Minnesota's strategy was really grounded in like the reality of living in Minnesota and being a Minnesotan. So rather than contract everything out or go for a long road trip, we determined that our best angle at this would be these things that we've dubbed digital connection committees. Digital connection committees are self-selected work groups that have formed on a voluntary basis by political subdivisions, tribes, there are anchor institutions representing a number of committees. There are nonprofits, businesses, faith-based organizations. There are committees of one person, it, it counts. There are committees of 20 people. There are committees that have formed based on work that's been done for years, committees that are newly created just for this purpose. The scope of work for these committees has been to receive and share updates from our office to help gather local information about digital inclusion, assets, needs, and goals. This information profoundly shaped the draft plan that we're working with now. We provided some optional templates and guides for focus groups, for surveys, for one-on-one -on -one interviews, but committees were really encouraged to think about what would work best locally with the group of people they were trying to gather information from. And last, committees, serve as a network of partners for our office to call on as this work progresses. Um, you saw on a previous slide that that capacity grant runs through 2028. So we are just getting started here. We ended up with quite a few digital connection committees that represented new Americans. Um, the list of them is here. A lot of them ended up relying on um, conducting surveys and focus groups in additional languages other than English, like Hmong, Mandarin, Karen, um, Oromo, Somali, and Spanish. And so this is what the full process ended up looking like when I condense it down to a single PowerPoint slide. We ended up with 106 of those digital connection committees, which is about five times more than I ever imagined we would get. Um, they did the most of their work during April through June, doing surveys and focus groups and interviews to collect quantitative and qualitative data. We wanted to um, make sure that we were not just valuing numbers, but also valuing stories and perspectives. So we had a statewide representation with these committees with an even mix of urban and rural. We were able to do non-competitive mini grants of $4,000, which is how you get 106 groups to participate. Um, these these non-competitive mini grants supported organizations, especially small organizations, really small businesses in um, the staff time and energy it takes to collect data. We received 236 different data files from these committees in all of those languages listed on the previous slide. And we also conducted 154 face-to-face, -face, usually you know, Zoom to Zoom meetings between our office committees and additional planning partners. In July, I crawled under a rock and wrote the draft plan. And then August and September, we solicited uh, feedback through a public comment process. We accepted comments in writing on a draft of the digital opportunity plan. And then we also hosted 18 listening sessions. Um, 16 were in person, two were virtual. We had over 300 attendees and spent three, 35 hours talking in these sessions. Um, we drove 2,500 miles and also at the same time received 203 pages of written public comments. We heard um, last week, I think it was, from our colleagues in Kansas that they're 
public comment period resulted in eight comments totaling eight pages. Um, and so I'm really, really happy with the way that Minnesota's has turned out. The Digital Connection Committees have done incredible work from start to, to now, and they, I'm sure, will continue to as well. So this is where we are now. Um, the original draft of the plan is still posted on our website. I'll put some links in the chat a little while on, and I'll share these slides so that you can view them later. Um, the plan is really focused on supporting um, at the grassroots level access to technology. I think one of the biggest gaps in technology access right now that we heard again and again and again through our digital connection committees is around having adequate technology support. So having a trusted person with the skills who can help you do the things you're trying to do. In many cases, that means having language access available um, and making sure that digital skills are being taught in a way that's culturally responsive. We submitted a revised draft of this plan to NTIA just this morning, actually. And I'm sure there will be more revisions because that's how the federal planning process goes. Once we have it approved, we'll share this revised draft for public, I don't know, amusement. And then up next is a lot of waiting for us, at least. Um, we have to wait for NTIA to approve this draft. We need NTIA to tell us how much funding we'll actually have access to through that capacity grant. And we need them to publish the capacity grant notice of funding opportunity and the application so we can actually get those funds. The funding for the capacity grant that Minnesota will receive is going to be determined based on a formula. Um, and when we give it our best guess, it looks like we could get 20 to $25 million total as a state. So that's the funds we'll be working with to implement this plan. One of the kind of key um, mechanisms for distributing that funding will be a combination of competitive and non-competitive grants. Something we heard often in the listening sessions that we did was that it's not enough to just make a grant available. You have to make grant funding available in a way that is equitable in that process itself. Otherwise, you end up in that situation of the same large, usually metro-based organizations are getting um, the same funds over and over, while smaller organizations, often organizations that are led by people of color, um, get left behind. So we want to make sure that we're leveling some of that ground. And to do that, we're exploring some non-competitive grant opportunities. So here's how you can be involved now and later, lots of later but also now. Um, one, you can become familiar with the Office of Broadband Development and digital equity as a concept, and then consider applying for a grant someday whenever those become available. We have an e-newsletter that we send out sparingly, um, judiciously, and so you can sign up to receive that. There is an organization called the National Digital Inclusion Alliance that has a ton of resources available about digital equity and um, asset mapping, uh, different resources to support communities in creating more equitable technology ecosystems. Um, so I recommend checking out that if this is something you're interested in or see a need for where you are. Second, um, consider registering a digital connection committee. We're gonna be changing this model a, a little bit coming up soon. Um, but we're still going to continue building this as a coalition. We know that with digital equity, we ultimately cannot create equity without policy change. Um, at the same time, that's not something this plan is able to do. We can't make policy changes through this digital equity plan. We know that that comes on the ground through the hard work that people are doing each and every day. So we can at least support the coming together of people to create the change that needs to happen. If this is something you're interested, please just email me. My email address is hannah.buckland at state.mn.us. 
And then last, I know we have the draft of the plan submitted, but this process is never done in a lot of ways. And so if um, you have thoughts about digital equity strategies that would make the biggest difference in the lives of the people you serve, please consider just reaching out to have a conversation about that. Send me an email, we can schedule a meeting. I'm happy to talk more about all of this. And I'm doing great on time. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, and again, um, just to set uh, the, the, the tone for questions, um, we know that immigrants and refugees are, are, are mostly impacted by the, the uh, you know, lack of digital access, you know, in terms of jobs and remote working opportunities, accessing health, uh, telehealth services, uh, you know, public services, legal services, even online classes, um, you know, civic engagement, you know, social events, um, information about language, all this is ways that, that, that the digital divide affects uh, the immigrant and refugee communities. And again, we have immigrant and refugee providers, service providers that are doing the digital liter literacy classes. Um, some of them I heard are doing, you know, um, you know, their lending devices. I have seen some programs with the with insurance services about with health insurance services, you know, lending tablets to uh, to folks. Um, I've seen organizations helping people with telehealth services, job searches. Um, all this is ways that you all help the immigrant communities. But again, we welcome your questions and um, how you can always be a, uh, you know, of help to uh, this state plan. Um, I have a question online. I will, I will start with that. Then I'll, maybe I'll start with you, Ekta. Then we'll come to the uh, question in the chat. Thanks, Abdi. Um, and thank you, Anna, for the presentation. I have a question. So um, in your third bullet about getting involved in this, uh, is it like a feedback on um, the Digital Equity Act? And so my question is, you know, a lot of the time, many folks you know, they won't, you know, especially in the refugee immigrant community and BIPOC, people would not send email or give feedback. So is there a, like a focus group or a pilot, like where people can come and really understand what it means? Because I think it's um, a lot of information. So I was wondering if there is a place or a focus group or a pilot where people like many, you know, like-minded from the refugee immigrant BIPOC community can come together and really understand what it means and give more concrete feedback than just sending an email. So that was my question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so during the public comment period, which was August and September, all of the digital connection committees were made aware that this plan was available. Um, and so some were able to bring their, their participant groups back together to review the content and submit comments. Um, and we did receive quite a few comments from um, a few of the digital connection committees representing new Americans. Um, so we're at this weird point right now where we're not actively seeking more feedback, um, just that I would be open to more as people are interested in providing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I, I think these are, uh... Question from Ian says, how, how are all different communities being included in the planning process uh, to ensure a holistic approach? You may have touched on this, but I'll let you answer that. Yeah, that was the um, idea behind the Digital Connection Committees strategy and the non-competitive mini grants to support those committees. Um, we wanted to make sure that this plan and the process of planning it was grounded in equity, that this wasn't just a bunch of, you know, bureaucrats coming together to say what we think should be done, but rather something that's coming from, you know, real people themselves. Um, so by having these digital connection committees, we were able to get a really broad spectrum of participation. Great. Um... Thank you. 
And again, I will invite any other questions or comments before we move to the next uh, question. We have about five more minutes from this section, so we'll, we'll, we'll invite questions. You can always unmute yourself um, and ask the question if you don't want to type. It looks like we don't have other questions. We'll come back to it. Uh, we have one more question here, two more questions from Sabrina and Ian. Um, can immigrants be included in the six focus groups that the digital equity act already specified? And then the second question is, uh, since these are recorded Zoom, will we, further, will we have further access to this and the link listed in the session? Yes, we will have the, 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 the recording posted and we'll have a blog post uh, that we will also share. And um, you can always reach out to me by email and I can also send you the, the recording, but I'll make sure it comes to you, Sabrina. And then uh, the next question I'll have uh, Hannah answer that. Yeah, so every state is like required to address those eight covered populations that I listed earlier. And immigrants fit in several of them. Um, you know, as individuals, as well as as a larger population group. Um, the state of Utah is one that has added some additional covered populations. So they have a section of their digital opportunity or digital equity plan specifically looking at immigrant and refugee groups. We haven't done that in Minnesota. That doesn't mean we won't do that later. Um, just that right now we're sticking with the eight required ones and we might expand in the future. It's certainly something that's come up. Again, thank you so much, um, Hannah, for, for, for the... Um, <laughs> Sorry, I just I had to giggle at the loss of internet. Yeah, it does look like some of the uh, questions are coming in up as we thought so. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Um, uh, Linda uh, is asking, um, did you see if you are planning to share the presentations? Are you, are you um, okay with sending out the presentation, Hannah? Yes, absolutely. And I'll send you the slides um, once we're done here so that you can share those fully. Perfect. Again, we'll yep. send the, 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 the uh, presentations. They have the Hannah's email and, and all the links. And you can always ask any follow-up questions to uh, so Hannah, you will have the email there. And thank you so much, Hannah, for, for the presentation. I really appreciate the time for you taking the time. And we'll go over to our next presenter um, right now. That would be Vanessa from the Workforce Development Team that will talk about some of the RFPs that we've been trying to uh, push out. And of course, I see Anne, and welcome to. Over to you or both. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks so much for having us. We're excited to be here. Um, Vanessa is going to pull up the um, yeah. our, our presentation. I am. I am not a Zoom expert. So just give me one second. Yes. Wonderful. Perfect. So again, thank you so much for having us. My name is Ann Myers. I am from the Adult Career Pathways team here at DEED in the Employment and Training Division. Um, just a little introduction of our team, um, the Adult Career Pathways. Leadership is Mark Majors, the Deputy Commissioner of Workforce Development. Um, the Adult Career Pathways team is made up of myself and Vanessa Roman, who will introduce herself. Um, 
Jenny Lee Drilling, Zukiswa Mpande Olson, Christina Valella, and Mei Zhang. Um, they are all uh, uh, adult career pathways coordinators. So within Deeds Employment and Training Division, the Adult Career Pathways uh, Department provides funding to organizations across Minnesota to provide employment and training services to individual participants through these various programs. Our team works uh, as soon as the legislative budgets are done and, and programs uh, are set. We work really hard to release uh, requests for proposals, and it usually occurs every two years. Um, our team uh, uh, puts out the request for proposals. We gather all the applications, and then we make recommendations to the commissioner and Mark on who we recommend for funding. So when we're looking at that, when the ACP team gets those applications, we're really focused on three themes within the applications and within our recommendations. So we want to ensure that the training programs that these uh, uh, organizations will provide are taking into account equity, that they're seeking to build an inclusive, skilled workforce and reduce disparities based on race, disability, and gender that they are uh, recognizing innovation, um, that new solutions must be developed to, to respond to new and ongoing challenges in our workforce and in our communities. A good example of this is how a lot of our organizations pivoted during COVID-19 or at the onset of COVID-19, like they did a great job of pivoting from in-person classes to online classes. So we're really looking for innovative approaches to reach the participants or individuals in the entire state. We also take into consideration performance. So we look at a grantee's uh, past performance, we look at their job placement, we look at the wage rate, what are the folks exiting their programs earning? We look at job retention and how long are these folks staying in jobs and how long is the organization looking to assist them? You know, we all know working with participants that the first 90 days of a job is challenging it's typically the time the kids get sick or the car breaks down and so we really want organizations to focus on helping participants get over that initial hump um, of, of getting into the workforce and then we also look at credential attainment are the credentials certificates industry specific or industry recognized are they going to get participants from point a to point c and like what does that look like so the adult career pathways we have many different programs and really what it is is different pots of money right so our our most popular um, is the uh, Pathways to Prosperity grant. Um, and really quickly, so last year uh, in state fiscal year 22-23, the Adult Career Pathways team managed over 150 contracts to over 90 organizations across Minnesota. So again, those programs and those organizations were funded to offer the opportunity for participants to earn industry recognized skills and credentials in areas such as CNA, CDL, uh, Certified Child Development Associate, um, IT, technology, things like that. All of our training programs are free to participants and include a job placement and retention portion. So uh, currently the state fiscal year 24, 25, those RFPs are currently in the review process. A couple of them haven't been released yet and a couple of them are currently live. So we can answer very few questions about the programs that are currently live. Um, but um, if you have a question, you can certainly type it in the chat, but just know we may be limited as to what we can say. So back to Pathways to Prosperity. It's, it is one of our most popular and it's been around for, well, at least since I've been at Deed, maybe six years, something like that. A couple of years ago, the ACP team took the Pathways to Prosperity program and we divided it into three separate RFPs or programs. So the first one is on ramp to career pathways. And that really looks at offering participants certificates, 
or basic skills training. So it's really that on-ramp, getting them going on that pathway to a career. Then we have bridge to career pathway, and that really looks at the next step, right, off getting them uh, industry uh, recognized credential, which means with no other experience in that field, once a participant earns that credential, they can get a job in that field. CNA is our most popular example of that. And then we have individualized training pathway. This is a very specific, specifically individualized training to their or the participants' interests and goals. If a participant wants to go to school to um, be an LPN, for example, this, this uh, program would help them do that. The next one, um, so we do have a mul multiple adult direct appropriations. And these, the programs on these vary. The eligibility of participants vary and they're really determined by legislation. So they are very clearly stated or hopefully stated in legislation as to what those organizations must offer with those funds. We have WISA uh, or Women's Economic Security Act. Again, a training program, um, but its eligibility is specific to train women in non-traditional occupations. Thinking more about like construction or welding, uh, we have CDL and IT is one of them. And then we have Southeast Asian Economic Disparities. That is, um, eligibility specific to individuals of Southeast Asian descent. So we really want the focus to be on that population and to make sure that those folks are getting opportunities to earn credentials, to receive training, to get job placement services and things that are unique to that culture. We also have adult support services and this is <clears throat> very unique. It's funding and training that further supports an existing workforce training program, or it can assist an organization to develop new training programs. And then getting to work is really exactly what the title is, right? It's assisting low-income individuals with obtaining or repairing a vehicle to get to work. So transportation, we know, is a big issue across the state, especially in greater Minnesota. And so this program offers the opportunity for organizations to help participants with um, overcoming that barrier. And then we have the Minnesota Tech and Minnesota Forward Tech Training Programs. Those are very specific to offering IT industry specific credentials. New to this year, um, which these have not been released yet, but we will be offering a can train um, uh, or an RFP will be released for can train. Then we're um, specific to legislation. It's training individuals to work in the new cannabis industry. And then we have clean energy. Um, and that again is training individuals to work in the clean energy industry or field. I will turn it over to Vanessa now to talk about the new ones. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about two new RFPs uh, that we have posted right now. So um, some of the questions, because it is an active RFP, we're not able to answer a lot of questions um, in, a, in a back and forth kind of conversation manner Be to give everyone the same information and give everyone the same advantage. All questions regarding the RFP must be submitted in writing. And then we post the responses so um, all can take advantage of those answers. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is the Drive for Five. Um, this RFP is currently up and taking application on our uh, competitive grants and contracts website, which you will see right here. Um, it is divided into two parts. The first part being industry sector training focused on five key industries. So this is workforce training in one of the five uh, industries of the caring professions, um, information technology, labor, construction, and education and professional services. And then part two of the RFP is job placement with uh, 
trade that's only open to trade associations and chambers of commerce. And they will be providing um, employer engagement strategies and diversity, equity, inclusion training for uh, the members of those chambers of commerce. Um, it's about, let's see, I think 6 million or so available each year under this RFP. And organizations may apply for up to 750,000 of that each year for a total of $1.5 million. And within Drive for Five, they're really looking for programs that train in credential level training and combine that with work-based learning opportunities. So internships, paid work experience, on the job training contracts to really set participants up for success and a career pathway. And then um, the other RFP, and this is the big one that we came here to talk about today is our targeted populations workforce grant. Again, this is an active request for proposals. It's available on our website right now for applications. Um, the RFP is divided into three parts. The first part is job and skills training. So this is your standard workforce development services that you think, um, think about. So credential attainment, um, could be things like digital literacy, financial literacy, job skills, um, resume writing, all sorts of different things that you can do, work-based learning opportunities, um, potentially tuition reimbursement, remedial training, career counseling, mentorship, job placement, all things that we would look for in job and skills training. Organizational mentorship, that's part 1B, that um, you, a smaller community-based organization, can partner with a larger organization to assist them with delivering this grant. And that would be someone who's established in uh, workforce services, assisting a smaller, newer organization to deed with the administration, um, case management best practices, um, workforce one, some of the data entry requirements and reporting that um, it gets to be a lot for a new organization with all the requirements on a state grant. And that's, um, we're really encouraging partnerships to help um, organizations kind of wind their way through this. And then uh, part two is entrepreneurship training. So training um, eligible, eligible individuals in entrepreneurship practices. So an organization can apply for the first part, which is part 1A, just the job and skills training. You could apply for job skills and skills training and organizational mentorship. You can apply for just entrepreneurship training, or you can apply for all three parts. So um, with the targeted populations, this grant is really targeting uh, organizations who are smaller. You have to be a community-based organization, 501c3, with revenue of $1 million or less must provide workforce development services, must be located in a historically underserved community of color or low income community, and serve a population that generally reflects the community that they're located in. There is $18.5 million available through this grant. Um, and that is each year. There's a max award of $750,000 per year. So 1.5 million available in the grants. Grants for this one will end on December 31st, 2025. So it's a little under two years by the time the grants get awarded and the contracts get executed. We're highly encouraging people to partner, organizations to partner to deliver these services. And we did hold an informational webinar about this this grant and this opportunity. Um, I put the link in there because I'm assuming the materials from this uh, webinar will be available also so you can view the webinar. And it's also listed on our homepage. So we're really excited about this grant. It's really targeted to smaller organizations serving uh, people who have been disenfranchised from the workforce or maybe that they're currently not able to connect to other workforce services. 
Um, so I encourage you to spread the word, look at this grant, talk to your partners about this grant. This is a great opportunity. It's gonna be an opportunity for organizations to really uh, develop capacity and deliver services to uh, Minnesotans across the state. Um, one thing about eligibility for individual level, many of the ACP programs have specific participants. Many similar eligibility criteria include um, low income individuals, that they have to be 18 years of age or older, that the participants have a goal of attaining a certificate or credential. Participants have a goal to obtain employment, uh, individuals with barriers to employment, and individuals of color. That's not um, a comprehensive list, and some of our RFPs may have some of these elements. Some may have, you know, more or less, depending on the legislation that ties it to to, um, to the funding. So a little bit about the Adult Career Pathways programs. Last year, or last biennium, I should say, so state fiscal year 22 and 23. Um, adult Career Pathways programs served 8,176 people. Of those, 5,373 enrolled in uh, certificate or credential training. 70%, 3,786 completed training. And uh, 1,386, 26% um, got credentials. So they got, um, could be a occupational skills license, an applied associates or applied associates in science degree, uh, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science degree, different recognized credentials or completion of apprenticeship. 26% of the participants participating in these programs exit into employment at an average wage of $19.51 per hour. So that is based on our workforce one day. And we know that there's even more participants out there being served by our program. Really excited about these opportunities. Encourage you to please check them out. Please contact us with any questions that you have. Our email addresses are listed right on the RFPs and on um, our competitive grants and contracts homepage. So. And we also have our adult career pathway specific webpage, min.gov, deed ACP. Anne? Really quickly. So that 19, was it 1951 yeah. um, for state fiscal year 22, 23? In state fiscal year 2021, it was $16.44. Wow. So I think that's great news. I know the inflation has gone up as well, but it's great news that it's, it did increase, you know, by over $3. So that's super helpful. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing and see if there's any questions that we can answer. I do think there were some questions, Vanessa. I will go through them really quick. Okay. We just got a phenomenal. Um, are state employees eligible for these grants? Um, these grants are for organizations to apply for, especially the targeted populations grant that is um, the only people eligible for that grant to administer and receive the grant is a 501c3 community-based organization with revenue for, of $1 million or less. Um, okay, and then one that said your microphone was static. Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for grants to smaller organizations. Yep, we're super excited about the targeted populations. Um, RFP, we really want to get the word out to as many organizations as possible to get them to look at it, read it, see if it fits with your organization and see how, um, how we can get some funding to you. Uh, there's a thanks that is good news for us. Question about, is there a requirement for a GED high school diploma? Seems like an odd question, but when working with community, this is one of the barriers that we've seen. Um, with in the immigrant community. I think that's very, that's very true. I think we've seen it as well. It, we use it usually as one of our eligibility criteria that if you're lacking a high school diploma or GED, um, that that automatic, automatically will make you eligible for most of our training programs. Um, 
that organizations facilitate. So, um, so yeah, we definitely take that into consideration. Not all, not all um, certificates or credentials, you know, require GED or high school diploma, but we definitely want to set folks up for success and obtaining that GED in high school or high school diploma is important. So there is no requirement to be eligible to participate in this grant or be served by this grant for a participant to have a high school diploma or a GED. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's up to the organization to decide how how you would serve someone with a G, no GED or high school diploma and you know make that a priority in um, in serving serving them. Yeah, uh, okay. The other one, uh, are you sharing your PowerPoint? Yes, we can definitely send it to Abdi and then we can, he can share it out. Um, this would be if you work for the state, but might also have a 501c3. Your 501c3 must be active. I would encourage you to look at the eligibility um, criteria for the applicants. And then obviously there is a conflict of interest disclosure that must be um, written in, in every application for a grant. And then the Drive for Five initiative competitive grants are for 24 months. So the Drive for Five, it ends uh, 6 30, 2025. Uh, sorry, I came in late. Is there a link to the RFP? Yep, and I can put it in the chat, or Vanessa can put it in the chat too. Oh, there thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Great minds think alike. Um, <clears throat> we have clients that come with high credentials, but from overseas and can score high on reading, math, writing, but again, don't have one from the U.S. Yeah, a couple of years ago, we were able to provide funding to organizations for internationally trained professionals which was amazing. I know that when I worked in the field, like it was a big, that's a big issue. We have somebody coming from another country with doctorates and master's degrees and things like that, and not being able to transfer that, um, those uh, diplomas or degrees over to the US was just, it was difficult to find some place to do that. So we currently do have what's called the Internationally Trained Professionals uh, we have providers that provide assistance to um, uh, clients that have overseas uh, credentials, degrees, diplomas, things like that, and they help them transfer them over to uh, the U.S. Uh, so we do have that. Unfortunately, it didn't get refunded in state fiscal year 24-25, but we, the, the ones that are current, the providers that are currently offering that go till uh, June 30th of 2024. So I can certainly put a link into, um, I think we might have, I think there's a link in on our website. I can put the link to the, those organizations in here as well. And those participants, you know, would, would very likely be eligible for both Drive for Five and um, targeted populations. We can't speak broadly to any one person's individual eligibility, but there's absolutely nothing that would, from what you're saying, prevent them from enrolling in one of these grants. Yep, and I just put the put the link in the chat. So. Uh, again, encourage you to look at the RFP, view the webinars um, that are out there for both Drive for Five targeted populations. Please email any questions that you have, and um, we look forward and, and spread the word. You know, we want to make sure that organizations are really aware that the, this opportunity is out there. Yeah, and just really quickly, the Drive for Five is open until December 11th. That closes at 5 p.m. on December 11th. And the targeted populations RFP closes on January 3rd yep. at, at 5, 5 p.m. So um, all the links or all the information about both RFPs are on the link that Vanessa put into the chat. Again, I just can't encourage you enough to like look in there and see if any of the, the RFPs um, would uh, benefit your organization. And I, the other thing I'm going to jump in again, um, encourage you to read the whole RFP. Yeah, I, I've definitely answered a lot of questions um, being 
because someone didn't read the entire RFP or didn't only read the first couple pages, then there's a lot more to it. So I encourage you to read the entire RFP. Yeah, Linda put a comment in there about unfortunate about the international education consultant not being refunded. Yeah, I think, yeah, that was disappointing to me. I was super excited about that. Um, who's the main contact for that program? So I did put the link to the uh, page, our webpage. Um, and so it does have uh, flyers for all of the providers that are currently offering those services. If that's helpful, or I or like the main contact with ACP, you can email me. Both for you. I'm not sure the last, is that both for year 2024? Both of these grants will start sometime in early 2024. And, um, and Drive for Five, the grant contracts will end June 30th, 2025, and for targeted populations, 12-31-2025. We can't say exactly when they will start based on, you know, we have to get the applications in and award them and, and we go from there. If there's another question about uh, putting the link to apply for this grant into the chat, Vanessa did put it up at the top, um, or not at the top, but a little ways up. Um, so you just have to go to the, uh, contracts and grant web page with deed and then scroll down and look for either drive for five or targeted population and or targeted population you can apply for both <laughs> you put a comment there if someone wants to listen yeah before you send out the others you can Thank you so much for having us. We you. You know, look forward to working with you. Happy to answer any questions. Um, again, thank you for having us. Thanks. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you. Great presentation. I know we have a couple other, uh, some of the major, you know, uh, the partners are not, some of them are not in the call yet, and we have other food feedback and follow up questions from them when they listen to the recording. So we'll reach out to you. I know I and ECTA received this kind of feedback and we'll reach out to you by email or we'll send you the feedback right away. Thank you so much again. I think we'll go ahead to the next section here. And I wanna, uh, before I get into uh, the updates that I wanna give, I just wanna give a moment to ECTA if you wanna say something for a minute or two and then I can go ahead and do the other updates from the. Sure. Um, I don't know why the voice, the sound is kind of fuzzy even. Maybe it's just the Zoom, but um, thank you, Abdi. And this was a great presentation from Vanessa. I just want to say, and Anne, um, and I think targeted publish and RFP, I just want to, again, say it's very important for small organizations, a great opportunity. So please definitely, you know, look for it, apply, and any question, these two individuals are there to help and answer the technical aspect. Um, and it really supports small nonprofits. So um, great opportunity and uh, for many organizations. I just want to give kudos to both of them for the presentation. Um, just for the public engagement, as you know, I, I met most of you, but I don't know if I met everyone last time. So I'm the director of public engagement at DEED. Um, and my role is um, doing meaningful conversation with organizations and communities and hosting uh, town halls and outreach sessions. So if anyone from this group is interested in having a one-on-one -on -one meeting or if there are specific topics that we want to have a discussion conversation about, you know, about our programs and process um, or, you know, how to access different resources, I think um, there's an opportunity at ONA at this uh, forum. Um, I can facilitate with Abdi, um, Assistant Commissioner Abdi Wahab. And um, another role that uh, public engagement does is um, many community events. So if your organization or communities are hosting or planning any events upcoming um, in the near future, I would say for 2024, 
please reach out to me because we are we want to make sure that we are present and building that relationship in the communities with many refugee immigrant organizations so that's one of our biggest goal and so you know if you have um uh, any events coming up, you know, you can just send an email to me or if you want to have a one on one conversation about, you know, um, anything about our process and programs, happy to have those conversation and uh, listen to those feedback and bring back to the, you know, to our uh, program leads. Um, I, I think there was a ch some somebody was asking for an email if um, Abdivab, maybe he can add my email. I'll do it after this, but looking forward for um having meaningful conversation, um, any events coming up in 2024. Uh, right now we are planning to build those kind of pipelines. So keep that in mind. And we want to make sure we have a, a good relationship and engagement process from the community and deed. So, and that is my role. So look for me. And if you don't remember my name, I'll put it in the chat. I think Abdi just did it. Thank you so much. So that's my email. And please feel free to reach out and any questions about any grant process access and having a conversation, happy to do that. So uh, put me in the link and uh, I'll be on my calendar, I'll be connected. So that's the update from me, Abdi. I don't know if there is anything else. And if there are events coming up for your organization, please, please send it over to our team and we'll be happy to you know host and partner with you. Thanks. Okay, so, um, moving along, I know we have some time. I wanted to introduce a program to uh, folks here that we've been working on and um, will be uh, excited to launch this program next year. Um, but just a background with that program is, it is something with legal services. Um, you remember that, you know, there is some data that says there's about, you know, about 1,239 undocumented residents per charitable immigration attorney. And that means we have, shortage of immigration attorneys, you know, providers, legal service uh, providers in the state. And we have some of the dollars that from the last session went to our DHS department that we're looking forward to roll out. And our nonprofit legal service providers will be rolling out that. And in a way to prepare for that, uh, we are uh, looking at how can we build that capacity. And we have a pilot program that um, our, our, our friends across the river, Wisconsin, have been doing for a while that we want to bring home and make sure we extend it to Minnesota. Uh, this program will, will train or will help uh, um, some folks from Minnesota, up to five individuals uh, who are seeking to get a DOJ accreditation, which is uh, a program that allows non-attorneys uh, nonprofit organizations to be, provide immigration legal services. Uh, so up to five individuals from the state of Minnesota who want to get this credentialing or a credential will participate in a pilot program with a Catholic Legal Immigration Network Clinic in short. Um, they are a national legal support agency for charitable immigration programs. And um, the individuals will receive training, technical support on how to become you know, accredited with the DOJ. Uh, in addition to the DOJ accreditation, training and technical assistance, there will be a tailored program for employment authorization documentation. As you may know, we have received a lot of folks that came into the state and for them to be self-sufficient and, 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 and not access the shelter and be, you know, provide for their families, they need to get the employment authorization document. <clears throat> and a way to help that, you know, they need the legal service providers to, to, to be familiar with that process. And so that's going to be something that's a big mission. But I want to take this moment to um, invite someone who is special to this program, someone who's done it, uh, and someone who worked closely with us at the Office of New Americans, and that is Janice, uh, the person who leads the Office of New Americans in Wisconsin, uh, to just say how she can be involved in this program and what they have done so far in Wisconsin. Thanks. Thanks, Abdul. Um, hi, everybody. It's um, wonderful to, to be here and, and meet all of you. So um, a, a little bit of, of background. Um, we launched the Capacity Building Mentorship Initiative with Clinic early this, earlier this year um, in, I think we, we launched it in, in May. 
And so um, what we noticed here in Wisconsin through our immigration legal service provider work group was that aspiring accredited representatives had a barrier to being successful in the application process. And that's that they, it was very hard for them to find like that hands-on experience needed to become a Department of Justice accredited representative. And so we not we launched an initiative, the Capacity Building Mentorship Initiative, and um, I'll put the uh, I'll put a link here in the chat earlier this year, um, in which we um, partner with Clinic, and um, our we have uh, we have now sixteen mentees in the program, and they have access to to free training, including the 40 hour comprehensive overview of immigration law training. And then we match them with mentors so that they can get that hands on experience and um, be successful in the application process when applying for a credit to become accredited representatives. And um, also, we're really um, focused on some areas here in Wisconsin, we have some areas of the state where there's just an immigration legal desert, like in northern Wisconsin, there aren't any nonprofit immigration legal service providers. So we're also focused on launching some some new programs in the state. So and as Abdi mentioned, we um, procured some additional funding to um, expand our programs. So we're going to be offering uh, uh, additional training for our mentees and welcoming five new mentees from from Minnesota and um, our participants, um, both in Wisconsin and Minnesota will be um, partnering together, engaging in peer learning, have access to uh, a uh, tailored training in employment authorization as it relates to humanitarian based statuses. And, um, and we'll all be attending um, an in-person clinic convening that's gonna take place in, in Minnesota next year. So we're really excited for, for the program, for expanding it and for partnering with all of you in, in Minnesota. Thank you, Janice. So uh, we are in the middle of having this uh, program. You know, we, we are working with the mentoring foundation. We'll have an MOU signed clinic uh, to get that pilot project. And then we will have an information session for mentees. And that's the most important information we wanted to share today that look out for that invite for all of you to uh, disseminate it to folks that want to get this DOJ certification is a really cool program that you can a, help you, the people get the, the legal services they need without being a, an attorney or a lawyer. And uh, you just have to work at a nonprofit that is DOJ certified and that has maybe an attorney that's mentoring that program and, and, and do the, the work that you get from this training. And so there are a couple of uh, you know, uh, questions or a couple of uh, um, um, qualifications that we need for someone to meet for them to be a mentee in this program. And we only have five slots uh, as a start. So um, we'll do that information program probably next week on the 28th and um, look out for that and let us know if you have other people you want us to invite into that program. So thank you so much, Janice. We really appreciate you being here and highlighting this program and hopefully we'll have much more um, you know, mentees in the, in the coming few years. Uh, thank you so much. Great. And um, so I'll also be attending the um, the informational session. So I'll look forward, hopefully, to, to see. I'll see you um, for sure. I'll be there and hopefully um, some some of all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, bit I wanted to bring to your attention, everyone, is that last week we had our, our DHS uh, friends uh, from the Department of Human Services I talk about the um, specialized services for the new Americans and the long-term care. And we had uh, an RFI that was out, that was released. And uh, we just wanted to um, make sure that we circle back and let everyone know that that, that request for information is out there. Uh, the deadline is fast approaching. And so we wanted to make sure that we, um, we let you know that uh, by Monday, December um, 11th, no, um, 
maybe December 11th, I think, or we have a, um, an online, um, we'll be hosting an online information December. Um, uh, that's a email from last time. But um, just wanted to let everyone know that that uh, RFI is still out there and we want people to um, um, reach out with information on how to best serve um, that information that's supporting support for the Americans in the long-term care. And the other um, one that I wanted to bring to your attention is um, you know, the DNR um, natural resource department that reached out and um, is, um, is seeking input to the translation of the language access plan that they put out there. Um, I will also share that uh, with some of you. Please do look out, look at that translation in some of the languages that we have. And if you have any feedback, I'll, I'll send an email, I'll write the email here for you to uh, send that uh, feedback to uh, DNR directly. Uh, please do uh, take part in that and look at if that language access um, translation is, is as um, um, good as it should be for everyone who speaks the language that they're translating it for. Um, I know that Redwan is here from the uh, Department of Human Services. Um, he's shared some of the program, but I will, I will maybe give the microphone to you, Redwan, back, uh, Hamza, to see if you have any information, if I missed anything. Uh, yes, Abdi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this, we have issued this request for information, as, as Abdi said, uh, back in October 16. Uh, it was due to close uh, on November 20th. However, uh, we will still want to hear from some of the agencies that we would like to hear, and we extended the time period to December 11. So I just shared the link uh, with you uh, in an email. In addition to that, we also sent um, an email uh, with a meeting invite uh, for to some of the targeted communities uh, today, uh, asking them if they are not able to provide the feedback online, they can provide the request the information via emails. If that if the email doesn't work for them, they can join us uh, on a conference call or via Zoom. Uh, we sent a link as well uh, for de December 15 between 1 and 3 p.m. So we would like to hear from as many people as possible. The program, uh, as Abdi mentioned, is that the legislator created this $28 million one-time appropriation to be spent between uh, fiscal year 24 to 27. It is meant to help new Americans uh, kind of access to a, a home and community-based services or long-term care uh, workforce uh, for trainings and uh, for many other support services so that the, the new Americans can be trained and the fund can be used for uh, you know, course fees, child costs, transportation, tuition fees, um, you know, financial coaching, mental health, and all other needed uh, areas uh, using this grant. So we would like to hear from as many organizations as possible in order to uh, create a comprehensive RFP to be issued soon. So we would like to hear from um, uh, organizations serving new Americans, uh, any community-based organization or resettlement agencies that are working with this population, we would really like to hear from you and uh, please uh, take part on this uh, initiative. Thanks, Abhi. I shared uh, the link to register for the webinar, the information session, uh, where clinic is hosting uh, a potential mentees to know about the maybe UOG certification program to serve immigrants and refugees here in Sorry that I mentioned. Um, follow that link and register and we'll see you there. I think that's it for me for the updates uh, and I will just open up for everyone to um, just share um, if there's any uh, relevant uh, information or any upcoming uh, programs that, that touches on the immigrant and refugee community. Uh, please unmute yourself and, and just tell us which organization you are from and what event or community update you want to share.
Perfect. If there's none, uh, we're happy to give back 10 minutes of your time and uh, close the uh, call a bit early. I know it's Thanksgiving week, so everyone is probably excited to log off for the rest of the day. And um, if there's none, I will be happy to uh, end the call. And thank you so much, everyone, for um, uh, joining us. I'll reply to the emails that I've received for those asking for the presentation. And uh, look out for the recording. Please visit our website. Uh, we always post the recordings and we always post a blog post uh, that, that summarizes what we've talked about. So uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, thank you so much and see you until next time.